and um, we are excited to hear that he's progressing. Um, they took that tube out. Awesome, awesome. And one of my prayer warrior friends said, be sure and tell Craig God's got some awesome witnessing for him to do. And a lot of people are going to know Jesus because of his miracle. So, We have one more night of Christmas at Landmark tonight. And if you have not participated, there's still time. Oh my, two nights the last night. That's cute. That's a really bad face on that baby. <laughs> That's more than sad. <laughs> That's a somebody please change my diaper face. <laughs> oh. If you signed up to host a room or something and you think you may have signed up, be sure and check to make sure you did uh, or if you need to change it or something. Also, we do have some quite a few rooms uh, that will be unattended un if somebody, some more people don't si sign up. So it's back there. Uh, sign up for a room, check that sheet, and get the word out. So share it on your social media that we're still doing this one more night and on Facebook and whatever. Call people, invite them out. There is no master's class this Wednesday. And for you who are new, master's class is an adult Bible study led by Pastor Scott on Wednesday evening, evenings at 7 p.m. And we're going to start back up on January 6th. And next, this coming, it's not next, December 31st, uh, this coming Thursday night, we're going to have game night here at Landmark. It will be potluck except for drinks, sandwiches, and cupcakes. So bring something like a salad or chips or a side dish and, of course, games. And we might need a few card tables, but I think we have plenty of chairs. And um, there is a sheet back there for reservation numbers. And just because we want to fix enough food. And we would just love to have you all come and celebrate New Year's Eve. We don't expect you to stay all night if you don't want to. It's okay if you want to go home early or if you've got another party to go to, whatever. But uh, just come and eat with us and, and uh, enjoy some games. And I do expect everyone's car to be started at midnight. Because I'm going home. Five after. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you want to stay later, we can stay later. Um, and also, we need people to sign up to clean, clean the church in the coming months. Um, if you're interested in helping clean or kids' church or treats from Sunday morning, some way to get involved, uh, there are some sign-up sheets back there. And keep watch on that information table because you never know what's going to show up. This week, there is Ladies Bible Study uh, sign up because that's going to start in January, on January 11th at 1 p.m. here in, uh, over in the mansion. We do not pass a plate here at Landmark Community Church. And there are good reasons for that, but which I won't go into. But there is a box back there with a hole in the top and it is just waiting for your tithes and offerings. If you choose this as your church family and home, please remember to give so that we can continue to give. And we are so glad um, to see more chairs filled. We're, we're very happy about that. Um, this is a family, and you will, for the, anyone who's new, you're gonna soon discover that this is a family. And the, the elders are supposed to be wearing badges. Oh, yeah, you got yours on. And I think Bruce had his on this morning. But the elders wear badges. And if you would like to get to know more about the church, um, 
see one of us afterwards. If you need prayer, see one of us afterwards. We are willing to talk to you. You can also give online at landmarkcommunity.church. So if you will pray with me. Oh, Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've ordained, who are we that you are mindful of us? Father, your name is excellent above all the earth. And we praise you. We thank you, Father, for the redeeming grace that you brought with you when you walked among us as Emmanuel. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that came to dwell in us. You offer us your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to guide us, to direct us, to watch over us, to hold our tongue when we need to hold our tongue, to check our spirit, Lord. Thank you for that Holy Spirit that dwells with us. And help us, Lord, to abide in you as we look to a new year, Father. Give us a hearty and new healthy sense of your indwelling and your willingness to abide with us. So, Lord, help us to take that step. You're only ever a step away, and it's usually us that has to take the step. So help us, Father, to take that step and be closer to you and abide with you. Be with us now, Lord, as we worship you. Pour out your spirit on this room that we can worship you with our whole heart and soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and greet one another, please? And if there's somebody you don't know, make an extra effort.
special request here from Teresa Ripkema. She loves We Three Kings. So uh, we haven't done this for a long time. It's an extremely long hymn. So we're just doing some of the, the, of the, the standard. Kids could be dismissed at Children's Church. Well, Bob Limbaugh is here after a successful uh, hip uh, replacement. He was here Christmas Eve, but didn't point him out, but there he is. Ready, he said, to challenge anybody for a run around the lake. He's ready. Bionic hip and everything. It's great. Uh, Bob Steele, Wes Steele's brother, has COVID pneumonia. He's at the VA. We want to pray for him. I uh, want to keep praying for, for Craig Garricks, but I'm telling you, uh, yeah. That was truly a Christmas miracle uh, when um, Corey let us know that she received a, a phone call. At first, she was a little concerned, right? The respiratory uh, therapist, I think, was there and said, somebody wants to talk to you. And then to hear the hoarse voice of her dad say, Merry Christmas, uh, after that vent was uh, taken out. Wow. Um, you know, we were talking the night before on Christmas Eve about about Jesus and why miracles were so important in his day and why they still are today. Um, and I want to remind you, you know, all, all life is a miracle. And I know there's people that say, you know, I won't believe until I see a miracle. And I say, what are you? Explain the I, right? Uh, I understand there's 
50 million fiber optics, fiber, fiber, opt fiber optic, optic nerves that pass between the front and the back of the eye in a little space a quarter of an inch. And somehow it's your brain that sees, not your eye, but the brain sees. I, you know, and, and, and just life, everything around us, as far as we can see and comprehend the universe, do we need another miracle? That's why the Apostle Paul says in the very beginning of Romans, he says, you know, look around you, the creation itself is proof. But I guess when you're born here and you're just kind of used to life itself, it's no longer a miracle. God understands that. So every once in a while, he'll drop one on us. And we know there's no promise. Just Jesus never said, I promise to heal every disease, answer you know, all of your prayers for a miracle. He, doesn't, he never made that promise. He did, however, of course, make the promise that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he does promise to heal the worst thing you have because it's not cancer. It's not COVID. It's sin. And the eternal effects of our sin is what would have taken us out forever. And that is what he promises to heal. And I'd rather know that my sins are healed, taken away from me, that I'm healed of that, the eternal effects of my sin, than of a disease. Because life on this planet is a blink of an eye anyway. How long is eternity? That's why we want to be healed of the thing that separates us from God. Only Jesus provides that healing, and that is what he came to earth for 2,000 years ago, and Merry Christmas to you uh, with that news. That is the good news. So we're going to pray, and then I'm um, going to introduce the word for this morning. Father God, we praise you for Christmas. We thank you that it was your perfect plan in eternity past. At the time, you decided it was the right time to send your Son, the only Savior of humankind, the only remedy for human sin and rebellion, Jesus, that he came, that he lived the life we could not live, and then he died the death we deserve, and he paid the price that we owe you for our sin and our rebellion. Glory to you, God, for it. Glory to you. God, you're amazing that you would do this, and your plan would even include to fill us with your very Spirit, that we would hear you, feel you, sense you, hear your voice, be led by your unseen hand, and know that we are not alone, but loved, deeply loved and cared for by you, God of the universe. Father, we thank you for Craig Eric's, your servant and our brother. Thank you, God, for a Christmas miracle. So many of us, we pray the night before thinking about what Jesus did everywhere he walked, where it says he healed every disease, every problem, every problem that was brought before him. Every person with a, an issue, a disease, an illness that was brought to him, he healed. Every single one without exception. And so many of us were thinking of Craig and wondering, would you even on Christmas Day, can you bring him off of that vent just to show yourself to perform one of your rare miracles? Um, I heard it said, everybody, if, if, if miracles happened all the time, they'd be called regulars. But Lord, you performed a miracle. And we thank you for it. And we're asking you, just knowing that you're going to continue to open up his airway, help him on his own to, to take full, deep breaths of air where he will need no help and that he'll be on his feet and he'll be back here with his family and with his church family. And we're going to thank you in advance for it, don't we, everybody? For Wes's brother, Bob, Lord, that to have that COVID pneumonia, we're asking you do the same for him that you did for Craig, that you would begin to heal him, you would use the folks there, the, the very talented staff there at the VA, to give special attention to, to Bob, that they would do all that is in their uh, ability to do to treat the pneumonia, to get rid of the replication of this uh, virus 
and that you would guard his life by guarding his breathing, his respiratory system. You would restore him to full health. And for the kids over in the mansion and for ourselves here in this room, we're asking now that what we're about to hear and watch, we would take to heart and we would personalize it that you would do the work that only you can do, the heart surgery that only you can do in each of us. And that's what we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Some of you may have seen what you're about to see. You may have seen it already. Uh, some of you may know Francis Chan. Uh, he's a pastor that he felt the Lord called to leave the United States. Uh, to do something else that he believed mattered more. And as we are now closing 2020, thank the Lord, I think, because, you know, 2021 could be, it could be a lot worse. But we know the God of the universe, and so he will lead us through 2021 like he's taken us through 2020. But as we enter a new year, we close out one, we enter a new one, not to be, um, oh, cheesy or shallow, but New Year's resolutions somehow always come around, even in the Christian community. And you think, I got a new year. You know, there's, there's, there's a newness, a new start, a new time to maybe make a, a resolution, um, a decision about something, try something different, maybe, you know, finally complete something you've wanted to, etc. There is nothing more important than asking that kind of question with a spiritual uh, paradigm and say, Father God, what is it that you would do through me? What would you have to do in my life and through my life? Is there something more? Is there something better? Something more permanent? more purposeful, more meaningful. Think about that as you watch Pastor Francis Chan right here. And I grew up um, not far from here, spent most of my early years here, and God's been so good to me. I, I, I can't, like with one final message, try to describe how good my life has been how much God has taken me through. I was born in San Francisco when my mother died while she was giving birth to me. Um, later on, my dad remarried, and, um, but then my stepmother, uh, when I was about seven or eight, went off the Antioch Bridge and died in a car accident, and then uh, dad remarried, and then when I was around 12 in seventh grade, my dad died of cancer. We're living in Stockton, and it was during that time that I really began to seek God. You know, burying your parents, there's something that's pretty uh, terrifying as a kid to watch, and, and it, it makes you think about life differently. And during those years, God was so good to me, um, gave me a church family and people who loved me, and I... I just, I, I marvel, I go, why? Why were you so good to me? Why have you been so good to me? Now married, 52 years old, have seven kids, two grandkids. And last year, last year we celebrate our 25 year anniversary and my wife at dinner looks at me at dinner and she says, honey, do you, can you think of anyone on the earth that is as blessed as we are. She goes, I think about it and I think, God, I know there has to be someone on the earth that is as happy as we are. But she goes, I've just, I've never met them. I don't know anyone who has been this blessed, do you? First of all, that's a great question to be asked on your 25 year anniversary from your wife, right? Yeah. Praise God. But 
as she asked me that, I, I said, no, I, I feel the same way. It's like, I know like God doesn't, I don't think he gives like preferential treatment or something, but, but our lives have been ridiculous. It's like outrageous the way he answers prayer so specifically and takes us beyond like anything we ever even prayed for. Like it's beyond what we could ask or imagine. Like why, I, I feel like we're the happiest people that we know. And, and that was last year. And this, this last year has been even better than the other 25. Like God's taken us to this other level where you just keep going. We're, we're in tears often going, God, are you, are you kidding me? Are you serious right now? Is this really happening to us? I, I mean, six months ago, and then six months ago, we were in uh, Burma or Myanmar and, and we're in these slums and, and it was just my family and I, our, my wife and I and our four younger kids. And we're going from hut to hut uh, in, in one of the most disgusting, you know, physically places that we've been to. And we have a translator with us and we're talking to people who have never heard a single word from this book. And through a translator, I'm, I'm looking these people in the eyes and they're thrilled to have us in their hut. But many of them have never seen a foreigner, you know? And, and, and as we're explaining, as I'm explaining to them, no, someone made you. I mean, to look into a human being's eyes and go, you weren't an accident. You weren't just this random thing. I, I don't know where you think you came from, but there is this being who had a plan and he made you specifically. And he made you to have a relationship with him, to know him and to look them in the eyes and go, I know him. Like I speak to him and he answers me and these things happen. And to tell them that this God is our judge that we stand before one day. But this judge is full of mercy, is rich in mercy, and he actually loves us. And, and I, I've come to tell you the most amazing news ever is that, that God would have his only son come down and take the form of a man to show the world how much he loved his creation and to have him pay the price for their sin on the cross so that we could take his right standing with God and how he rose from the dead and, and, and how I no longer have to fear death or anything that comes my way and how he'll literally put his spirit in me and now I am one with him and I'm a member of his body and I'm sharing this message with people who've never heard a single sentence of this and they're just looking at me in the eyes and they're just hungry for it. And from the reports of people that followed up later, they're going, oh no, they were anxious to get baptized. They're, they're following him, walking with him. They're hungry. And, and, and I just remember when we got back on the plane after spending some time out there and coming back to the US, I just, I looked at my wife, I go, what do we do? Like, what are we gonna do tomorrow? What are we gonna do next week? What do we do on a normal day? that even compares to this. I go, man, every time my testimony or, or those words came out of my mouth, I just felt so happy. Like this is what I'm made for. I go, what, 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 what better thing could we do with our lives? And I just said to her, I go, what if we move? And she just said, let's do it. And so Thursday, we're, we're taking the family. And what's been amazing is that my older married kids, my two son-in-laws have fasted and prayed and said, we're going to Asia with you. And I'm like, what? Again, my wife, we're just, we're going, God, this is impossible. This, this, this doesn't happen. I've never heard of anything like this. This is too good, too good. A few weeks ago, my wife and I, we were back in, in Burma and 
we're in a different area and, and, and speaking at an outreach, like bigger than that. I mean, it's just thousands of people and to see what God was doing. And I, and I went home that night and I go, I want to do this every day, every day. Why can't I do this every day? But then the next night we went to a village. We just went into this village. This was even better. There was not a single Christian in this village. From best we understand, they've never heard one word of the gospel. But this woman we befriended, she, she had built relationship with the village elder and, and, and they allowed us in and said that, you know, that, that we could share our story with them. And to have a whole village, you know, in one place who've never heard. And for me to just, as the words were coming out of my mouth, I can't tell you how happy I was. I can't tell you how you just go, this is why I'm alive. This is the whole point of my existence. This is why I'm here to share this message. And, and my translator told me afterwards, he goes, he goes, when we started driving into that village, he goes, my heart was pounding. He goes, cause I came here years ago and they chased me out, throwing rocks at me, coming at me with knives. And he tells me after, you know, and, but, you know, he goes, just understand it was, he goes, some of the things you said scared me, but we translate it word for word going, what are they going to do? And these people were believing. And after the message, we said, Hey, is anyone sick? Does anyone need to be healed? And, and let me just say, let me preface this. This is very new to me. Most of my Christian life, I did not believe in supernatural healing. I was taught it doesn't happen anymore. But the more I studied this book, the more I'm going, that doesn't make sense. It looks like it continues. I don't see why it stops. It seems like as we reach out in faith that God still wants to display his power. So while I'm there, I'm praying. But, and I've believed this for a few years now, but every time I pray, nothing would happen. But that night in that village, I'm going, God, these people have believed one thing their whole lives. And there, there's some really elderly people sitting at my feet. How am I supposed to convince them that this message that contradicts everything they've ever believed is true? God, you have to do something. There's little children here. I have no power. I'm speaking through a translator. You need to do something. Please visit, show them one night of power like nothing they've ever seen in their lives, begging God for this and believing, believing scriptures, scriptures that I memorized as a high school student came alive in me where I believe that Christ and I are one. And I was walking around that village and going, this is no different than if Jesus walked through this village because he says, I can do whatever he did and I can do greater things than he did. John 14, 12, and I, I memorized that as a high school student. I believe it right now. I am Jesus right now. He and I are one. He abides in me, I abide in him. These are not just memory verses. And there was a faith and that God granted to me. And as people came forward, I still remember the first old lady came over, hunched over, just an elderly lady, telling me through the translator, her back is in tremendous pain and laying hands on her and saying, in the name of Jesus be healed. And this woman going, what is this fire I feel on my back? What is this burning? And she's going, all the pain is gone. And that's the power of God. Next person, come on up here, one at a time. Everyone, for, you guys, this is not normal to me. This is the first time in my life, 52 years, I've never experienced this. Everyone I touched got healed. It was a crazy thing. I've always wanted to see this. I've even gone to other places where I thought I would see it. I never saw it. You guys, so this is not some guy that says, oh yeah, then this happened and you know. This was freaking me. The, the night before, okay, the night before there was a, there was a little girl, probably about 10 years old and her little brother, probably around seven, deaf and mute since the day they were born. 
And we laid hands on that little girl. She starts crying and smiling as she's hearing for the first time and then praying for her little brother. And man, and I'm, I'm a skeptic, so I'm asking, okay, you sure? You sure? No, they were deaf, 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 right? No, because I don't know. I, don't, I wanna believe and I don't want this to be an emotional thing. You know, and, and it's like, then we even sent a team to them the next day, go find out if they are, st- if this is really, seriously. And I wanna know they really hear and to see it happen. Understand, this freaked me out. It shouldn't have, but it did, just because I'd never seen it. It's like I had faith, like it's there, it's just when you don't see it. And I saw it and I, and, and I got to partake in it that night and be a part of what I believe is supposed to happen. And that night, I'm telling my wife, can I get a water from someone? I, uh, I just thought I wanna do this every day of my life. This is so real, so crazy good. And, oh yeah, it's not open right, okay. <laughs> That's not. Mm. Oh good, good, thank you. Um, you know, the peace I felt sharing the gospel to people who've never heard, I want every one of you to feel that. And we get caught up in stuff out here. We just do. As many talks as my wife and I have had where my wife even just said, honey, we get talked out of things. You know, like nice church people talk us out of convictions that we know are in scripture and somehow convince us to play it safe. Even though we know it contradicts us, can we just not let people talk us out of our convictions anymore? Because we do, we get caught up and you start believing that, no, it's my Christian duty to produce, you know, have a nice Christian home and keep my kids safe and you know, give them a good Christian education and just, I don't know, we, we end up justifying the things we want to do. And we, we somehow can block out those, those moments of, of prompting and conviction and, and feel justified in doing it. And it just happens. And there's so much of me that just, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to stand up here and go, oh yeah, here we go. We're heading in there and, and I'm fearless. I'm terrified. I was packing up my stuff yesterday. I put all the things that I need in one suitcase, all my clothes, and I'm just looking at my kids, looking at the house, throwing things away, thinking about, man, God, are we doing this again? Where we're just going, it's not easy. Everything in my flesh is things are so good right now. Why are we leaving again? Why are we going on this? The older you get, the more you feel like you have something you should hold on to or protect. And it's like, no, Jesus said, Jesus said, now do I believe this? In Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? These are the words of Christ. He goes, if anyone wants to follow me, he has to deny himself. And he has to take up his cross, meaning you suffer and die in any way I call you to. And you follow me. And he says, if anyone tries to save, savor, protect his life here on earth, he goes, I promise, this is a promise from God. I promise you, you will lose your life. And he goes, and I promise you, If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. My wife and I talk about the blessing in our life. The blessings that God has given us over these years was not because we always made the safe, good 
decision that worked in our favor. It was those times where we stepped out in faith and thought, oh, this is scary. Now we go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we did this. Like this life came, it followed faith. And that's not to say that, oh, look at Francis, he always lives by faith. There's so many times I've chickened out. My life is riddled with mistakes and failure. If you wanna find dirt on me, you'll find dirt on me. If you wanna see me say something wrong, you can find it and write an article about it. I've said things that are wrong, whatever. But the grace of God's been on my life. And those few times when I get it right and I hear the voice of God and I'm scared to death, but he gives me courage by his grace to do something I don't feel like doing. Those have been the most amazing blessings of my life. And so in these verses you go, man, do I believe that if I try to save, I will lose? It's a promise. And do I believe that if I lose it, not just for any silly reason, but for his sake, that we'll find life? I've gotta believe this promise. There's something about this peace I want you to have, and so much of it is being on his mission. Because you know, every day, you know, like this week, you kinda, you just live life, and you don't feel like you're really on his mission. You're not really thinking, you look at what you say you believe in eternity, and then you look at how you live your daily life and you're going, it doesn't match up. But when you're telling, there's something about telling people who haven't heard. There's something about that great commission and telling people, making disciples of people who've never heard of Jesus. I, I, I can't, it's just very different. It's very different than what I'm doing here. I, I tell people, it's kind of like, you know, in San Francisco, because I, I live out there. <coughs> everyone's a foodie, you know? Like, everyone's like tearing apart who has the best, you know, enchilada, who has the best Chinese food, who has the best, you know, and then and, and everyone just is kind of snobby with their food. And, and I kind of got into that too. I didn't argue with my wife, like, how could you call... Panda Express Chinese food. Like that's just, that doesn't make any sense. Like that's not real, you know? And so we'll have these talks and this and that. But about a year ago, I, uh, I was in Africa, which I go often. And, but this time there was just a sea of people in this camp, thousands of people and that, that are just no home, nothing to eat. And I hear this scream, like this screech, like right when I drove up and you see this woman just yelling, like it's terrifying when you hear a scream like, I've never heard a scream like this. And as I walk over to see, I see her son laying there lifeless on the ground, but he's like a skeleton where you're going, how could he have even survived this long? That, that does not look like it could ever walk. That doesn't, how it's like, it's just skin and bone and she is going nuts. And you just think, man, what if I got here yesterday? Or what if I had figured out a way or worked harder just to get food to him? And then you're seeing the sea of people and we're, we're trying to calculate how much it would cost to feed each person. And you know, okay, 12 cents, well, okay, but there's this many thousands. How many can we keep alive for how many days? And you start calculating, thinking of these things. It's hard to go back to San Francisco and be a foodie when you realize, no, people just want some food. And I guess that's what I feel. What happens in the church is we can become these spiritual foodies where we listen to another sermon and go, yeah, I think I like the one from three weeks ago. I think I like the one I listened to on Thursday. No, 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 it was Tuesday on this podcast. We can have sermons going, 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 and we can sit and bash each other and go, this guy's better than this guy. Oh, this guy's off, don't listen. Meanwhile, there's people that don't even know they have a creator. 
So it was very hard for me to be here and just, oh, let me give another sermon and be a little bit more creative so I can be better than that last one or this guy or different in this way to people who can hear sermons all day long when I go, they've never even heard the name. The name, Jesus. Jesus. They don't even know any one of you would be a theologian in some of these places. And yet we'll sit here and critique, criticize, pick. It's just hard once you see it to go, let me just keep cooking some special food for the next crowd. Um, there's a verse that I, because again, I'm telling you, it's by the grace of God that I have courage and my wife and I are planning on going to some sketchy places and, and you just go, what? What do we believe? Do we believe this? Do we believe he's worth it? And there's a verse again, like I say, I probably said, oh, I get it, I get it. I didn't get it. Because now I'm wrestling going, do I really believe this? In Acts 20, verse 24, Paul says, I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says in all truth, I don't consider my life of any value. You see me living, breathing my life, my wife, my kids, my platform, everything else, no value, zero, not of any value. It's not precious to me. The only thing that's precious to me is I've been given a mission to get this message of the gospel of grace. And so for me to live is to preach that message. And I would much rather die because I don't count my life on this earth of any value. So to look at this verse and go, God, do I believe this? Because other people seem to value my life. And they go, no, 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 we've got to keep you alive. No, your messages, they're important. They're this, they're that. No, we could have said that about the apostle Paul. Oh, we should have kept him alive another 30 years. But no, he goes, I don't count my life of any value. All I'm here to do is speak this message. And it's so easy to begin to value your life. And a verse like this, it just seems to make no sense. Because in the church, in America, we are obsessed with staying alive. And it's just very normal to us. Be careful, be careful, stay alive. Because I value your life and you should too. And we can hear all the messages. My wife and I, and it's like, oh, but your kids, they need you. They need you to stay up. Your ki no, my kids don't need me to stay up. They don't need a dad to stay alive till they're through high school. They need a dad who's willing to die for the gospel. And if something like that were to happen, you know, I tell them, man, it's the grace of God in my life because I'm scared of that. But maybe God will give me courage at that moment. Okay, when I talk about God's blessing, it's not just, oh, he has this nice little family. They're going to, no, his blessing is the courage he gives us. And if, if it were to, I don't want you to, to go, oh, he went over there and, you know, got this virus or whatever, or, or got imprisoned or whatever, and God failed him. No, that's actually the grace of God that gave me the courage. And if he gives me courage to die in his name, then forever I'm one of those. This scares me in the flesh. But if I get there, it's by the grace of God that he would give me this type of courage. And I just say that because this is the safety in the Christian life that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And everything's gonna be fine. Everything is fine in the end. And the battle now is trying not to save my life when it's comfortable and it's good, but trusting his word, not counting my life of any value, but believing that to lose your life, that's when you find it. Oh God, I pray that this message 
Lord, by your grace, by your grace, we need your grace, Lord, to believe this, not just say we believe it, but have lives that prove that we believe it. Oh God, please, Father, bless us with a deep belief in the words of Christ. In Jesus' name. That was the message for the day, wasn't it? Okay, listen. Uh, in a sentence, what did you hear? Let's see if we can remind ourselves of the entirety of that message. What did you hear? Don't fear. Lose your life to find it. Say it again. Okay. Okay. Be disciples. God does miracles. Okay. Everybody's hearing, everybody's counting. It sounds loud to me, so I'm not repeating it necessarily. Move out of a kind of There was a lot in that message. You know, you heard about um, his mother, you know, dying uh, when he was born, and then you know, the loss of then a stepmom and then his dad, uh, all while he is, he's a kid, while he says, my life has been great, it's so good, because of what he's experienced with God in his life. I mean, again, you, you think of what he came from, and then you listen to how he genuinely was saying how great and blessed his life is. And, um, you know, his partner, his wife, you know, partner in faith, partner in the gospel, you know, she's right there with him. Uh, the whole family uh, sensed that, you know, as they all sought the Lord, it was time um, to go where there was greater need. As if, you know, he, he says, it's kind of like the foodies, you know, thing. He goes, there's just already so much here. We're oversaturated here with the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, everybody's saved. Now, I mean, it's, it's surprising that as saturated we are, oversaturated as we are, um, with just this menu for anybody, for Christians and non-Christians to choose from. Um, and we still have so many unsaved people in the country. But he, he says, I'm, I want to go, obviously, to a place where nobody's ever heard a word about Jesus. And you, you saw the meaning that that brought to his life. And he then brought that to the Lord. He said, I want to do this every day. Lord, can I do this every day? And his entire family has that call. Now, you know, don't misunderstand the message or me. Um, I don't, can't tell you that God's calling every single Christian to that kind of a mission field. If you're called, you're called. Sometimes I think um, how do I say this? I, I prefer not to make a move until I really hear the Lord say something. Especially moves that significant. 
But that I also know Christians who have made a move. They just they felt like the Lord has already told us in His Word, "Go make disciples of all nations," and they went, and and they they just say they just watch the Lord do amazing things through them. So if you if you feel like you know what, um, I, I've heard from the Lord, or I'm just I'm just going to do it because I believe that the Lord has already made it clear that my job is to live for Him while I'm on earth, and and I need to. Uh, Alert people, uh, inform people, introduce people to Jesus, then you go do it. You know, not that you necessarily need to wait for a specific invitation from the Lord again, because he's already made the invitation. He's made the, the great commission, as we call it. He's commissioned us all to go make disciples. Um, but as, as you heard that message, did it convict you? In what ways were you convicted? And do you feel there's going to be a change that you're going to make? Starting with taking Jesus more seriously. Maybe being less concerned for your life. Possessions. Stuff we can't hold on to forever anyway. Amazing when he said, you know, my, my kids don't need a dad that lives forever, you know, lives a long time. My kids need a dad that's willing to die for the gospel. Would you agree? Does he need parent? Do, do kids need parents like that? Does Rapid City need a bunch of Christians that are willing to die for the gospel? It's not that the United States needs a, the Church of America to live a long time as much as we'd be willing to give whatever is required to introduce people to Jesus. Right? As you were listening, were you were the gears turning? Were you thinking, huh, I need to make some changes? Anything specific come to mind? Because if it's Myanmar or if it's here, I mean, it's going to require boldness and a belief. You know, like you said, do I really believe this? And, and I think that was pivotal when he came to that spot where he goes, do I really believe these verses that, you know, I was learning back in high school? Um, that, you know, from John 17 that we're going to be at in a couple of weeks, by the way, because we're going to return next Sunday into the, our study of the Gospel of John. And, um, and it's where Jesus has that prayer that that we'd all be one together, and that then we'd be like one with, with God. Not We don't become God. And when, don't misunderstand when he said, you know, I, I became, I'm Jesus. Not literally, figuratively. It's that, you know, he's one with Jesus. So it's, it's as if Jesus is, is walking through those slums through him. And, and, you know, we talked about healing before the, the video started. He experienced something that rarely is experienced. And that's not just where there is one person being healed when you pray for them. It's that every single person that came to you was touched by God and healed. And like you know, I said earlier at the beginning, that sometimes that's needed. You know, we need some more miracles every once in a while. Because even in this miraculous world, in this miraculous life, you think of the place where he went, where there's not even, there's no food. You talk about, you know, you heard about the mom with the little, the, the son who's just skin above. I mean, they, they need a miracle. I mean, to them, life is hell. Life on earth is not a miracle. It's a sentence. It's a death sentence. And they needed to, you know, receive a visit from God. But how do they do that? Because Jesus isn't still walking the earth except through us. So I would ask you, where would God send you? And to think hard about that. In fact, you may not even need to think very hard about it because it might already have come into your mind and I'd encourage you to write it down before you forget it because you'll forget it if you don't write it down now. 
as you were watching us, who did you need to, somebody come to mind, who do you need to speak to? Where do you need to be more bold? What were the things you were, you were being convicted about that you're going to let go of? You're not going to take it seriously anymore. What are you going to take more serious now? Write that stuff down. I'm going to guess that was a life-changing message for a certain number of people in this room. Maybe you've never heard anything like it. But I think that that's, a, that's one of those hinge point messages. It's a defining message. And I think we all need to take it to heart. Say, I need to re-examine my life and say, God, I need to not worship my comfort. Like he said, the older we, we get, the more we just kind of want to hang on to things. I mean, all of a sudden we've got things now comfortable. You know, we've got everything. If you're a guy, me, my, my garage is just looking great. I got all my tools here. I think and and to, to be told to pick up and leave and to leave stuff and to start from scratch again and oh it just seems so unstable and so many people, especially women, you know, love stability. What if God is very unstable to you because he calls you to something that is uncomfortable? We've talked about this. God's not concerned about your comfort. He's concerned about your obedience. And often what he calls us to do can be uncomfortable. Because it goes against the flow, the natural flow of the world. And people don't want to hear the gospel because it's uncomfortable. It messes with their comfort. I'm okay the way I am. And if there's a God, I'm sure he'll like me and accept me when I die. See, people don't like what comes with the gospel. It's a very uncomfortable message. But it's the truth, and they need to hear it. So, I trust you're going to be writing things down. And when I, when I say that, I encourage you actually to grab a pen right now and write down what you're thinking so you don't forget it, because you'll forget it. Now, anybody want the link to that video so you can see it again? Okay. So maybe, Tony, can you uh, land a gram that link to everybody? Is that a thumbs up? So you'll get that today if you're on our email list. I'd encourage you to watch it again. And, and maybe, maybe that's when you'll sit down with a pen and you'll, you'll say prayerfully, Lord, Lord, what am I to do in response to what I'm hearing? What changes I, am I to make? What do I make less of? What do I make more of? Where do you want me to be this year? And even just to, you know, just to say, Lord, I am open to whatever you want. And that's the key. Yeah, and I'll close with this. I've quoted from Henry Blackaby so many times because I, I just love what he has written in Experiencing God, the, the book and the workbook called Experiencing God. And he says, often we say, God, um, you know, show me your will and I'll be committed to it, whatever it is. And God says, I'm not going to show you my will until I first know that you're committed to it, whatever it is. And we say, well, you know, can, you know, like, you know, there may be the old game show, what's behind door number three? You know, what's behind it? Um, and it's as if, you know, we're saying, I want to, can, can I see what's behind the door? First, before I, you know, put the bid on it and, and, and trust in it. You know, and God is saying, I'm not going to show you what's behind the door until you say, I'm committed to do whatever it is behind the door. You got it? Because we always want to, to, we want God to speak to us first and to tell us what he wants from us, and then we'll decide if we really want to do it, is it worth it? And I think that's the reason why so many of us 
go through life as Christians. We're saved, but we feel like we're not really making a big difference. We're not making the dent that he wants to make with his Christianity, his walk with Jesus in this world, this lost world. Maybe we could say as a church family this morning, God, you you good with this? God, whatever you have for me, whatever you have for this church family, we right here, right now, commit ourselves to it, whatever it is. You don't have to show it to us first for us then to decide if if we're going to do it. We're going to commit to it now because whatever it is is better than whatever plan I've got for my life or any plan we have through this church. You've got to say this kind of thing right now. You say, Father, whatever you have for me, my family, that is better, that is more important than whatever plans I have. So I... I swap my plans for yours. So whatever it is, I I receive it. And I'll commit to it. Did you say that? That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? But if you know God, if you really know him, it's not that difficult. Because as we know in the Word, uh, in the entire story of the Bible, and in our own lives as we've walked with God for any length of time, He does know best. And whatever He wants is actually in your best interest. However difficult it may be, however scary it may be, it's in your best interest. And it's going to be in the best interest of other people. Your plan and my plan, we think it's in our best interest. Who knows better? God knows better. Sounds good? You ready to approach a new year? Well, thank you for listening to Francis Francis Chan. And... um, Let's even pray right now for him. Father, for Pastor Chan and his family. As they are in a new land right now, they've decided to obey what your call was for their entire family. We we know, we just know that we know you are using them powerfully. And as we've been watching this morning, it, it just makes us thirst for this. We want a life that matters. We want to be able to see the miraculous. We want to be able to say, we we feel you, Jesus, living in us, walking the world through us, touching other people through us, talking to people through us, through our lips, communicating to a lost world. Father, that's what we want. We want to make eternal differences as long as we are living. Forgive us for settling for the comfort and the small-minded American dream. We want your dream. What is your dream, Lord God, for this world, for Rapid City, for South Dakota? This is where you have us. What do you want for us? And we have said already, and we'll say again, whatever it is, Lord will do it. And then... Now, Lord, help us when the moment comes and you reveal what it is that we don't run from it. To change our mind because now it seems too difficult. But if you give it to us, you are more than able to take us through it. Whatever you bring us to, you can bring us through. Father, we thank you for our church family. Don't we, everybody? What a gift. We love it, and we, we even think that, Jesus, this very church family was on your mind when you were on the cross. You who knows, you know all things, all information, all knowledge. 
throughout all time. So you saw this. You saw even this morning and the decisions made here by us as individuals and as a church family. And Lord, now we're truly asking this become a, a remarkable place, a remarkable church family. So far, we've enjoyed it. We love it, but there's more. So much more of you to be experienced. So much more of you to be communicated through this church family. So much more of you to superintend everything that we do here. And more than anything, we want this place to be famous because you are here. And people would know Landmark Community Church, Jesus is there. Lord, we pray that for every church in this town. But we know every church has to make its own decision about what it wants to be. And you're hearing us this morning. Amen. Hey, let's stand. One more Christmas carol. Now we have to wait a whole year for more of these. That's rough. Wonderful week. Hey, we'll see you tonight. Listen, if, if, has anybody not come to Christmas at Landmark? You haven't come here at night to see it. Get over here and bring somebody. Listen, this is the this is the, this is the last time. Uh, given what we're talking about today, hit your Facebook page, whatever. Share, invite people who have never come here. Invite people, especially unbelievers. Invite them, and then we'll see you even Thursday night. Come on back for that. That'll be fun. Bye, everybody. Thank you.